Jessica Honiger, founder of the socially conscious fashion brand Noonday Collection. And this is the Going Scared podcast, where we cover all things impact, entrepreneurship, and courage. Today's guest on the show pretty much summarized the entire purpose of my podcast. Caitlin Crosby is the founder of The Giving Keys, and Britt Gilmore is the president of The Giving Keys. And together they are collaborating to create an impactful business called The Giving Keys that is truly changing lives around the world. This podcast truly does encompass impact, entrepreneurship, and courage. The Giving Keys employs people who are transitioning out of homelessness to make necklaces from keys with engraved inspirational messages like fearless, hope, believe, or courage. And when the wearer encounters someone else who needs a message, they are encouraged to embrace their word, then pay it forward by giving their product to a person who needs the message more. They are then invited to share their giving story on the company website. Since it began in 2009, the Giving Keys has provided job opportunities to more than 70 people who have been affected by homelessness, helping many move into permanent housing and collected thousands of giving stories. They have sold more than 500,000 keys. I wanted to have both Caitlin and Britt on the show. As a founder of a socially conscious fashion brand is similar to The Giving Keys, I'm so aware that a brand is about so much more than the founder. I love the quote by Maya Angelou that says, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. So I wanted you to meet one of the really important people that's helping The Giving Keys to grow and create a huge social impact, um, which is Britt, their president. And Caitlin and Britt have such a beautiful beautiful relationship. They truly have committed to a life of collaboration. And that is what the topic of this podcast is. As you remember, we are covering a special series. This podcast series is all about Imperfect Courage. Imperfect Courage is the book that I launched around a month ago. I hope that you have grabbed a copy. If you haven't, go grab your one because this series goes chapter by chapter through the book. And the chapter that we are covering this time around Around is chapter eight, commit to collaboration. Britt and Caitlin are such a powerful example of what it looks like to come together to create a culture of collaboration that is creating a culture of collaboration among the homeless and among other organizations in Los Angeles where they are based. So without further ado, here is the dynamic duo of Caitlin Crosby and Britt Gilmore. Okay, so I am have two guests on. I've done this one other time before, but in order for everyone to know who's talking, <laughs> Britt, why don't you share a little bit about you, your family, where you're from, and then Caitlin will share a little bit, and then we'll be able to know. You, you guys have actually really distinct dif- different voices, so I think we're going to be good with this, but <laughs> let's yeah. just start Hopefully. with a logistical thing. <laughs> nice. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, yeah, this is Britt, and I am originally from the Detroit area. Um, I moved out to LA almost nine years ago now, which is crazy. And I really started out in the fashion industry knowing that I wanted to do something where philanthropy and fashion were merged and came out to LA on a scholarship to the Fashion Institute here in downtown and uh, met Caitlin a few years after I graduated and it was just this really cool alignment um, of the dreams and desires that I had had from graduating high school and wanting to move into a really impact driven fashion company and, um, and where the giving keys was at and where Caitlin was at with getting that company built. And it just, yeah, it aligned really, really well. Um, and it's been six years almost crazy since I, came on board. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. Okay. Caitlin, what about you? Yes. So i uh, born and raised in Los Angeles. Um, do you want me to tell the, the, the origin story of the giving keys yet, or just more my background before giving keys? I think we know now. Okay. Britt, Britt's got probably a bit of a peaceful, grounded voice. Caitlin's got the excited Hollywood voice. Can we just say that? So I think our listeners now know <laughs> who's who. <laughs> okay. So 
Caitlin, yeah, I would love to hear. First of all, I'm just super excited to have y'all both on today because I feel like so many of us know who the Giving Keys are, especially this audience, because we obviously New Day Collection is a social impact brand. But I feel like as founders, you know, Caitlin, you and I, we get the spotlight a lot. And a lot of times it's like, we don't get to bring it out into the open, like how this takes a village. Like we did not do this on our own. This takes a village. And I feel like so many women are afraid to ask for help or to reach out or to, to, uh, they really just, in order to reach a giant vision, the reality is you've got to have other people to come alongside of you. And so I'm super excited to get both of you guys on the show today and to talk a little bit more of what that looks like. So before we launch, yeah, give me the 101 of what Giving Keys is, but then I actually want to step back a little bit and just hear the story behind the story about a little bit about your growing up. But yeah, go ahead and give us the Giving Keys 101. Okay. Giving Keys 101 uh, was started about 10 years ago. I was on tour doing music, um, writing songs. And I, I had a website at the time called loveyourflaws.com about body image issues. And no matter what I did in entertainment, it was never about entertainment. I actually hate performing. Um, it's, it was always about putting out messages, certain messages into the world, whether it be, um, about eating disorders or, you know, insecurities or, um, you know, religion or homelessness or social justice or whatever. I was always just really wanting to use art and creativity to, um, yeah, put out, uh, topics and issues that I'm passionate about. So at the time it was love your flaws and my album was called love your flaws. And I had t-shirts and bags and keychains and everything said love your flaws on it, on my uh, merchandise tables on tour. And um, one, one, one day in New York, passing through on tour, the hotel key was, I thought it was really cool. It was this big key. So I put around my necklace, got compliments on it. It was just something that I wore as part of, part of my touring outfit, whatever. And, um, and then I was at a locksmith one day and the person in front of me got numbers engraved. And I said, oh, do you have le- uh, letters? Can you engrave love your flaws on this key? And and then I saw all these old used keys on the side and I said, oh, while you're, while, while you're at it, can you engrave hope, love, faith, dream, belief, fearless, breathe, let go on these other keys. You've got that uh, down, girl. I mean, you just rattled those off. <laughs> and um, yeah, so h- how much would you charge me? So he said $8. So it was $3 per key, but then $5 to engrave letter by letter what the word would be. Um, so then after that, went to uh, you know different bead stores and bought um, different jewelry and clasps and this and that, and would make jewelry out of them with my cuticle clippers and my tweezers and would make them on planes and backstage, et cetera, in my hotel rooms and would start selling them on tour. Um, and then they started selling out more than my CDs. So I knew that people wow. were really resonating with the words and, and, um, because I had gone all around the world and took thousands of pictures of people holding up their love your flaws pictures. I was very comfortable and passionate about just people's journey in life and what they were going through. Um, and so I was always going up to them, you know, talking to them about their, um, yeah, their story. So it, this was just kind of like an extension of love your flaws in that way of saying, what are you going through in your life? What word do you need to embrace? So then for a few months, it was just that it was just about what word that you, what word do you need? But then it morphed into, uh, after touring and meeting so many people that needed these words, as well as myself and I would wear a different one every day and I would give them away to people and I was like oh this should be the thing this should be what it's actually about this is not just about us let's keep our eyes open for other people that are hurting and need the words on these keys too let's make it a pass it on pay it forward movement so I was always about movements and I was always about like wanting to start something that will change the world like ever since I was in in elementary school, junior high, I was always just wanting to be radical and start something and do something that will help people. And so I think, yeah, so it started that way. And so people would write me on MySpace at the time, like, okay, I gave my key away. Like you told me to, you know, so-and-so was about to commit suicide. So I gave them my key. So-and-so was, um, you know, uh, you know, my mom had cancer. I gave her my key. Someone was being bullied. I gave them my key, yada, yada, yada. And so I was crying all the time. I was like, you know what? I, I should make a website to store all of these stories um, so other people can read them other than my mom and I reading them and crying all the time. So then um, I, I, you know, I knew that something was really special 
with, with these keys. And so I thought, you know, I, I want the money to go to some sort of charity. And I waited for the missing link for about a year or so. And then I, I, I met this young homeless couple on Hollywood Boulevard. I was leaving church one day and I left bawling because they were playing an invisible children documentary. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I saw this young couple and they were, they held, they were holding up a sign that said, um, um, ugly, broke and hungry. And it really caught my eye and it looked like a love your flaws sign. And so I went up to them. I was like, why does your sign say that? Um, and then got to talking and I ended up taking them to dinner. And, um, so during dinner, I had my aha moment that I should start paying them to engrave the keys instead of the locksmith. So then little by little, I just hustled and hustled and got them into stores and would sell them at a million random events. And, um, and then they saved up enough money to get their own apartment. Um, so first they started staying in a motel and they got their own apartment. But when I met them, they l- literally lived and slept in a dumpster in a cardboard box. So, um, anyway, that's how it's, that's the origin story. So that's, that's the story. But in a nutshell, our mission is, um, you know, we, we, um, put out products that have inspirational words on them, not only keys. Now we've expanded, but the whole premise is we employ people that are trying to transition out of homelessness. So the more we sell, the more jobs we can create and the more people we can try to get off the streets. Mm. I just feel so much kindredness with y'all's mission because so many social impact companies are give back, but they're missing that piece of the actual job creation. Like creating Mm -hmm. jobs for vulnerable communities is no small thing. I mean, it requires a lot of of effort and grit and really taking a long-term view because people fall and then they have to get back up again. And um, I just... I love what you guys do. Now tell me what's the timeline? Cause when did you start that? When did you take that initial couple out to dinner and realize I'm going to pay it forward towards homelessness. And then you started selling them everywhere and then t- t- catch me up between then and then to when you met Brit. Yeah. We just had our 10 year anniversary, um, which is incredible of when it first started. So in 2008 is when I first started making them and selling them on tour and then I think I met Rob and Sarah either in 2009 or 2010, somewhere in there. I think it's on our website somewhere when I asked, when I last asked Sarah. Um, and then um, timeline of meeting Brit was, well, I'll back up a little bit. Um, once we started getting traction and the first PR, the first couple PR hits we got um, was super helpful. And then, um, we were in maybe, I don't know, 50 something stores around the U S and or world. And at that point I just had a, a production manager, a director of sales, and then a few people making them maybe a handful of random people here and there, but, um, but that was pretty much it. And yeah. I, and Brit was my one friend that was in fashion that I knew was actually a good person and had a good heart. And, um, and, so we, you know, got together a few times and then this one day our production manager quit. Um, and I texted a few people, does anybody know anybody? You know, we pay pretty much nothing, but, um, no health benefits or anything like that. It was still, at that we're level. changing lives. Yeah. But we were still at that point, I guess in, I don't know, at that point in 60, 70, 50, 70, I don't know. Yeah. And then I, so I texted a few people um, does anyone know anybody who would be, wants to be a production manager? And Britt was like, I actually might be interested. But Britt had a really great job at that point. She was, um, well, I'll let her tell her story. But but from my point of view, I was like, oh, really? Because um, I, I knew, I remember hearing that her job had health benefits and all of these things. And we definitely didn't have that at that point. So the fact that she said that she would was interested um, was really, was awesome. And so, and then she knew so many people like this guy, Daniel, who was one of her best guy friends. And she brought him to then be the production manager at some point and help out. And he was volunteering. And then, and then, and then, and then I remember we had a consultant, which was also one of Brit's friends from London. And he, and, and I was so stressed. And I remember he said, he's like, you need to pick one person that you trust more than anyone here, because I was, you know, getting emails and texts and calls from from all the different people, whether it be our director of sales or production or whatever. And I was like, I'm going crazy. This is so stressful. And he's like, you need to pick one person that can be your filter that everybody goes to her and then she can just go to you. So you can get the information from her and that can be your funnel. 
and who who like who do you think that person should be and i was like brit um she's definitely the one i trust the most most big picture wise that can kind of um that i i, I feel like can go above all of the departments and um so that's that's how that started and so did you have this like because I know for me noonday it was like I was just like selling out of people's homes and it it just took off and suddenly it was like oh wait a minute this is a business like I need to make this into a Mm -hmm. business I need to treat this like a business did you do you remember a decision point where you're like I'm gonna scale this this is gonna be a business this isn't gonna be just like oh like keys fun I mean do you remember that decision making point? Yeah, I think also I I had, I was in a different space because at the time, because I was acting and doing music like this, I wasn't even thinking of it as a business because it was just my like, oh, this is like my charity kind of thing. Like that's how I saw it. Like as this is my like give back in my life, you know, like a personal thing. And I wasn't taking any kind of salary or anything like that. It wasn't, I, I didn't think of it in that way. Cause I was making money in, you know, doing the other stuff. So I think the thing that shifted was, um, I had already been paying, a uh, this guy who was doing our website, who was also our production manager. And then some of our employees that were, um, transitioning out of homelessness. Um, but this one day I did, uh, MTV, I was on an MTV show at the time. And so MTV was really great at giving us like our first little push of press. And then I met, Oh no, it wasn't that it was, it was, um, I met this guy through this thing called summit series and he, he, uh, had just launched on the Huffington post when the Huffington post was like the coolest new place that everybody was getting their news from at the time it was the number one news source. Um, and he put, he's like, I want you to write this story. Cause he was, he loved the story. And so I wrote the story of the giving keys and how it started and the mission and everything. And, and they put it on the front page and it got a million views. And I got hundreds of emails from stores all over the world. And I was managing the stores that we had myself at that point, um, which I love doing. And, but it just got like, I, there's literally no way I can respond to all of these emails. And so that day, I remember when the Huffington Post came out, I was, freaking out and I was at some dinner party uh for my friend that got engaged and next to me was sitting this girl Elizabeth and I I was telling her about you know what I was doing and and I was like I need to find somebody who can you know head up my sales and take care of all of these stores and she was like I think I'm your person and she was Miss Louisiana and she moved out here to do acting (laughs) and modeling and it wasn't really working out for her and so she's like I think I'm your person. And so we met the next day at Don Cuco's, a Mexican restaurant. She gave me her resume over chips and salsa. And I was like, you're hired. And she was great. And so she really helped. So I think that at that, that was like the first kind of time where it felt like more of a business. Also my business manager at the time who would do all my finances, I would just pay the first couple um, cash and then he was like, we can't do this anymore, Caitlin. We have to set up, you know, like a, cause it was getting too, it was just, it was getting too crazy with like cash everywhere and not being able to track things. And, um, yeah. So I think once he started, he's like, we need to turn this into a real thing. And I wanted to turn it into a nonprofit at the beginning. Cause that's what I used to call it. Cause I, because I wasn't taking any money and I didn't really know what a nonprofit was other than it's some sort of charity. Like I didn't really have a name for what it, what it was that I was doing. So I think little so it was a combination that was like the time was a business manager saying okay we need to do this for tax reasons and you know to have some organization and then also especially once I had Elizabeth and and the guy Gilbert at the time like having to pay them in a proper way other than cash so so that that kind of made it official and then getting into when you stop paying cash you know you have a business you're like okay yeah Okay. Yeah, that's a really funny <laughs> quote. Um, but yeah, and also I think at the beginning, and this was before Elizabeth came to when we got into a showroom, even though we were already in stores, kind of when I first learned about the showroom world and reps, that felt real too. Kind of pitching mm-hmm. to a bunch of reps that were then going out and pitching other than me, like that felt more real. I love that. 
I mean, it just kind of took off without you sort of, and you kind of had to start grabbing the tail and letting it drag you a little bit. Oh, yeah. Okay, Britt. So Caitlin has started this thing. It's been a few years. She's not paying cash anymore, which is a good thing. She's got employees legitimately and you come in. So, but I'm wondering what drew you because I'm sure there was still, it was still a startup. You probably weren't getting paid the giant bucks that you could in fashion. So tell us a little more about that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really easy answer. It was the opportunity that was most aligned with the dream that I had for my career. And I had been in the fashion business really since I was 16 years old. I worked in retail and then went to fashion school and then worked in a bunch of different fashion jobs. And I had kind of gotten to the point with the fashion industry where it just didn't feel fulfilling. And I hadn't found that opportunity or created that idea that really merged impact and fashion together. So this was one of those moments where it was just like, oh my gosh, everything just aligned. It was it was really perfect in terms of just what I wanted and and what the Giving Keys needed at that point in time. And how did you know Caitlin? Like, how did you guys meet? So we met through a mutual friend um, at his birthday party, actually. And um, it's a, it's kind of a funny story because we were at this club in Hollywood dancing, and I think our first conversation was about our dance moves and. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was, it was a context that we don't find ourselves in often now, but we were just there for celebrating a friend's birthday and, um, we connected. And I think maybe the next time we saw each other is when we talked about giving keys and what she was doing with that and what the vision was. And I had let her know, I was really interested in volunteering my time. If I could come down to the office and support in any way, I just wanted to get involved in whatever capacity she needed. And within a few months is when the production manager that she had at the time had stepped down and she was looking for somebody to fill that position. And it happened to be, I think the really cool part of the story is that the day that she reached out to me about that job was the same day that my employer at the time laid off 35 of its 50 employees. And so the timing was just really serendipitous. Okay, so you have a background in fashion and merchandising, but you're now the president. So you're playing definitely more of an operational managerial role, developing others. Has that been a giant leap? And do you feel like you found your sweet spot? Or are you still getting to play in fashion? Like, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I think so. I My journey was kind of production manager to then web manager to then managing director and then president. And I think um, the parts of the, I guess the way I I would have described my job um, for the majority of the time that I have been in it is that I was kind of the person looking at whatever like the next initiative was and figuring out how to organize the team around it. So Caitlin's been the visionary of the company and um, has really cast a lot of ideas about where Giving Keys could go. And we typically don't have the infrastructure for each of those ideas in place. And so I was, I mean, kind of like the first thing that I did was replatform the website and really get that digital experience and the ability to purchase online more streamlined, easier, um, really get the site to be something that aligned with what the brand stood for and telling that story in a digital way. And then um, getting the team on board and building out like our HR program and um, getting production more organized and just each of those like new kind of frontiers or areas of the business needs a lot of attention on the front end to get up and running. And then you hand it off to people that can effectively manage it or coordinate it. So I felt like that was a lot of my job was like that operational, like let's create some infrastructure and some disciplines. But it's funny because I think there's also this other side of me that is creative and I love product and I love photo shoots and I love um, the more sort of like artistic creative sides. And And she's so good at all that too. (laughs) Thank you. I wish there was like five of Brit because (laughs) even though she has like had to do a lot of the technical operations and managing the people. Um, 
like she's really the only person that I also trust to do anything creative. Um, right. And so I wow. kind of she's a unicorn. Yeah. You found a unicorn. Every business owner I needs know. a unicorn. I just wish there was another <laughs> one. Just, <laughs> Caitlin, I will not what? steal her from what? you. Okay. I mean, I'm not kidding. I've had some moments in the past. You know, yeah. I thought, oh, Brit, Ooh. she looks like she's killing yeah. it. I could use a Brit. <laughs> Everybody could use a Brit. <laughs> Seriously, like the. I think if I could clone her, so then there'd be another one. So like you know, one Brit can do the, the, you know, all the impact and partnerships and help with that, but then also help with, yeah, photo shoots and design and, and product and, um, and spend time dreaming up things like that, as well as managing people because she has the heart too. So she can talk with people about, how they're feeling and try to like manage their emotions. Um. <laughs> so I'm curious, Caitlin, cause I remember at the beginning of starting noonday and we're starting to hire people and I'm like, Oh, I don't really like managing people. Like this is not, I'm not a good manager because I just want people to get it and move on. And like, I'm not good at managing people's feelings. And I think it's mainly cause I'm just like, we got stuff to do. Like I got to go after this vision and you just need to like run fast behind me. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. if you can't keep up, like, I don't know what to do for you. So was that similar where you, or I think you're a little bit more of a feeler than me, like a a little, maybe more caring about others, (laughs) but Uh, too much. Too much. So so maybe yours is the opposite where you're like, oh my gosh, managing people is swallowing me up alive and you couldn't do the whole like, hey, you're not performing. This isn't working. When did you kind of realize like this is, this is not, managing is not a role. And and then you realize that Britt was actually, that that she really thrives there. Oh, from the beginning. I, 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 and I, and I used to feel, well, I think I've gone through seasons. Like at the beginning, because I was doing so many other things, I, I, it wasn't even, I mean, I would manage our first, you know, guy that was doing our website and our production manager and the girl that was, became our director of sales. But I wouldn't even think of it as I was managing them. It was just kind of, we were all working together and getting, you know, like, hey, this needs to get done. Let's do this. This has to happen. Have you done this? Da, 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 da. So, I don't, I don't, I didn't even know the language of like managing people. I didn't know what that really meant. It was just like, just got to get stuff done. Um, so, but then I think once I, you know, learned more about business as, as it all unfolded and realized that there started when Brit came along and started having meetings with people that she was managing because we had to make an org chart to say who was reporting to who. Right. And, <laughs> you know, then I, you know, I started seeing that. So it was, there was never really like an opportunity to have those meetings. Like, I guess I would, like, even when I would have, like, if Brit, you know, Brit technically reports to me, but I feel like I, I, the way that I manage her is how I did it at the very beginning with the other people. It's I'm I'm not, I don't feel like I'm managing them. I just feel like we're all working together to try to get things done. So I think for the first time, um, I technically was managing somebody this the, for just a few months. And I was like, I have no idea how to do this. I don't know. It just felt like a weird new pressure. I don't know like the language that I'm supposed to, to speak. And, and it made me feel better because I, I was feeling bad about that for a while. And then I think once I talked to a few other people, like this one guy, he's, um, oh, I forgot his name, but um, we did a TEDx talk together at, this really cool advertising agency called 72 and sunny, but he Mm. used to head up. He was like, you know, would he worked for huge companies and, um, and he was like, Oh yeah, I, I can't, I do not manage anybody. He goes, that's just like, he goes a lot of, a lot of people like me and a lot of people like us, like we, we just should not manage people. Like he goes, I do not manage anybody. (laughs) So I I think the more I would hear things like that, that made me feel better that it's just like, that it's just, I'm not supposed to do that because it's not going to be effective. That transition was kind of hard for me though. Like when I realized, maybe because I felt like I was supposed to be good at everything for a yeah. while, yeah. you know? And yeah, you feel like, oh gosh, and you want, I mean, gosh, you want your people to have good managers. Um, but, you know, I think in order to scale a company, it's realizing your weaknesses and your strengths and then finding those people that have those strengths, which yeah. is so cool that you found that. In, yeah. And, 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 and Yeah. And I think, 
you know, it's kind of what you were saying at the, at the very beginning to kind of answer your question ahead of time, even though you a- asked it earlier, I think it, it really is all about a team. And I think, you know, I, I don't like that. It's uncomfortable for me when people come up to me, whether it be at conferences or wherever, or pop-up trunk shows, whatever, and people are super complimentary, like, you're inspiring or like, thank you or whatever. And I, I, it's like, I almost don't feel like I can receive it. Like I'm a little numb to it Mm. just because I'm like, it's not about me at all. Like this is, it takes so everybody it's, it's everybody on our team equally. Like, and so I, I don't feel like, I probably feel like I should take a little bit more pride in it, but I, Mm. I really feel like I don't like when people are complimentary. And I mean, that sounds maybe bad, but like, I, I just don't, I don't feel you want them to see the village. Yeah. yeah not I just don't, it's just not about me at all. I really right. don't like, and I feel like I, you, sometimes you kind of have to make it about you, whether you're doing podcasts or speaking. And so it's like you telling right. the story so that it ends up being about you, but I don't feel that way. Like, you know, it's right. like you have to tell totally. the story, but I, but I know in that, you know, and I want everybody to know that it is really about, every single person in our, in our building. Like we all need each other. Um, no, you know, yeah, we all need each other and everybody at our office works so hard. And I think now I'm, I'm a new mom and certain things that like, you know, I, if I stayed as late as all, all the people stay in the office or get in as early as other people do Mm -hmm. I literally would not see my baby and I do struggle with that so much right now but it's like all the extra hours that they're putting in the the office is taking them away from other things in their lives Mm -hmm. and um while I know we all do also once the baby goes down and people are done with dates or this or that you know we all a lot of times do emails at night as well also but I think like the hours that they're spending and the grind and the hard work and the meetings and the every single day is, I mean, so it's, it's really about the sacrifice. whole team. It is. And I think that's how you've been able to scale and build, right? Because yeah. you know, it's 100%. not all about you. Yes. I want to go back to this issue of homelessness, Britt, because was that something that you were already passionate about or did beginning your work with giving keys give you the passion? Like which came first? Yeah, I think in general, the whole idea of people living in poverty, whether that's homelessness or um, internationally people experiencing severe poverty, that was something that became really important to me um, pretty early on. And I, if I was going to identify like the source of that passion or that desire for justice and for there to be equal opportunities for everybody, um, I would say it really did come from the family that I grew up in because my dad was a pastor and my mom was always really involved in community development work. She still runs like a food distribution program for families living in um, neighborhoods in Detroit that are just underserved and don't have access to food. So I grew up with parents that really valued that and demonstrated that and brought us into um, community development work and service driven projects really early on. But I think the, the, the pivotal moment for me really was on a trip, uh, when I was in high school, I was a junior in high school. I went to India, London, and Thailand one summer. And I remember being in India and walking out of this coffee shop. And I saw this little girl who was probably six or seven years old. She had one and a half legs and was holding a baby begging for money. And I remember being so shocked at the reality that people were walking past her like she was invisible and thinking, how could you walk past a little girl begging for money? And I came back from that trip really, really, really inspired to do something. And so I told my mom, I was like, "We can we do something? Like, I'll throw benefit concerts. Let's start a nonprofit. I just want to raise money to send back to support Um, anybody who's doing work to support these kids that are living on the street in India. And something else I I find really important to say in attachment to that story is that I grew up in the U.S. around adults experiencing homelessness, and I didn't necessarily um, live in a culture that 
was was nurturing the idea that we should be stopping for these people. And I remember um, mm-hmm. my, my, my family cared about that. But I guess what I'm saying is in the U.S., we treat people that are adults experiencing homelessness like they're invisible all the time. And so it was like the same thing with that girl, that little girl, yeah, while it was crazy to me that their culture was desensitized to this little girl experiencing homelessness. We live in a country where we're desensitized to adults experiencing homelessness and we'll walk past them and not acknowledge them. And to kind of like further that point, I was uh, working with a friend on a project in Bethlehem and I was staying with a Palestinian family while working on that project. And I was doing that while I was working at the Giving Keys. And so I was sharing about my job. And I remember the father of the family being blown away that we even had a need for an organization or a business to create jobs specifically for people that were transitioning out of homelessness because they would never allow homelessness in their community. And we're talking about Bethlehem. Like this is not a part of the world that is well served or has means. And so to hear him coming from a place of poverty saying, Oh my gosh, if we saw someone on the street, we would 100% stop for them and invite them to stay in our home. Like you just would never let that happen. So I, it's, I think it's really, um, yeah. I think it's just good to audit like what we feel is normal and, and like take stock of that. So I think that that's that trip to India really was the moment that, um, instilled the desire to commit my time and energy and career to doing something to stop that, even though it wasn't homelessness in the traditional sense. Yeah. I feel like we all have that moment. I definitely had it, which I write a lot about in my book. It was when I went to Kenya, when I was a freshman, I, in high school, and I saw a woman running a brightly colored fruit stand and it was in a Nairobi slum. And I realized jobs could be a way out of poverty. And then before that, I had gone and worked in inner city DC for a summer with a bunch of other kids and had realized there is poverty in the United States and it's two miles from the White House. And I feel like we all have those moments where we wake up. It's what we choose to do when we do wake up. Caitlin, I'm curious. You, I know you just took this couple out to dinner. Okay. So a lot of people would have passed on by in that moment. Do you remember your first moment? You said as a kid, you were like on fire. Um, tell us about that. Well, I don't think it was ever an aha moment. I think I was born and raised in LA. And it's so funny. My mom just wrote me a text message, um, a week or so ago. And, and she said something like, yeah, your whole life, since you were a little girl, you were just obsessed with injustice and you were obsessed with, with Martin Luther King and you were obsessed with Rosa Parks and you were obsessed with people that were experiencing homelessness. Those are, she's like, those are your three like main things that you were just not okay with. And she's like, every year you want to do, to do a report on Martin Luther King. And then every, and even if you just did a report on Martin Luther King in a different class, a different subject, you somehow wanted to bring it back about Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks. Like you were obsessed with, with that. So I think, um, and I was always going up to people that were, you know, on the street and whether it be buying them food or just having conversations with them or giving them hugs or pray, like, you know, ask if I could pray with them or bring them somewhere, bring them to youth group with me or church or, um, whatever. And so I, it was just kind of my whole life. I had just always been like that. So it wasn't like a mm. one particular, it wasn't like, Oh, I met this one, you know, that the first, couple Sarah and Rob that was anything new it was just okay normal. that was just how you lived you're like yeah. you're hurting like you're a human you're not yeah. an object you're not less than and so you humanize people so let's talk a little bit about that because I do think you know and I do, I'm in this work of justice and yet I do get uncomfortable around homelessness like I'm like oh I, I want to do something and I don't know what and um, so what are, aside from buying the giving keys, which mm-hmm. we will continue to do. And I love all the new stuff you have coming out. I love the earrings. And oh, it's so cute. All so right. cute. We finally so, have color. I'm so excited about all of our colorful things. 
so fun. So fun. So I love all the new products. But in addition to that, because I know you guys are, in addition to the Giving Keys, are really wanting to be the leaders of this issue in LA, especially. So what are some tips? Maybe Britt, you share a couple. Caitlin, you share a couple of what do we do at the complexity that happens in our souls when we Mm -hmm. encounter homelessness? I love the, I I love the idea of, I heard someone say once, you know, if there was only one homeless person, everybody would be like, Oh, of course we got to help them. But because there's so many, I think people get so overwhelmed that they don't do anything. They're kind of frozen because they're so overwhelmed by, you know, how many people this issue affects. And, um, but it, yeah, but just think about it. If there was one person, uh, you know, that you pass in your car and they are holding up a sign, it's like, I think it would just be natural and normal to be like, oh, of course, here, here's some money or here, here's some food. Do you want a sandwich? What can I do? Can I help? Um, so I think, like you said, it's just about human to human, you know, contact interaction and, and genuinely caring for what they're going through. And I think, um, but obviously to be, balanced and have wisdom I think uh, you you can't trust everybody and so I think it's a case by case like sometimes there's somebody that is outside of 7-Eleven and I'm not going to say hi or buy Mm. them food or talk to them because I don't feel safe and I don't feel like that would be wise you can just have like that discerning feeling sometimes when you look when you see somebody and so I think it's just about when your heart tells you um you know, I want to connect with this person and encourage them. But as far as the issue of homelessness, other than buying our products, which does directly help the issue, I think um, what you what people can do in their communities is just, yeah, go up to people and have conversations with them and ask if they're hungry and buy them food or buy them blankets or shoes or underwear or toothpaste or tooth, you know, mouthwash or floss or just like take, be like, hey, do you want to walk over here to this Target or, hey, do you want to walk over here to this 7-Eleven and let's go shopping, you know, or Walmart or wherever, and let's just ask them what they need. I mean, that's like a, you know, a case by case. And I think Britt um, can maybe talk more about. Um, I love though that your default, though, is I feel like so many of our default is like, oh, they're just going to use it for drugs or they, why aren't they trying to find a job or whatever, all of the things that you Mm-hmm. And I think it's like switching the default for it to be on, oh, that's a person that I could just as easily be in that position if it wouldn't have been for whatever, fill in the blank. Mm-hmm. And just to have that moment of, of humanizing the situation, because I feel like that's your default. And, and I feel like we have to actually make that switch for that to be our default in order to even be able to discern. Because otherwise mm-hmm. our default is always going to be like, you know, they, I'm just, they're going to use this for drugs and I'm out and mm-hmm. we don't even treat them as humans. Yeah. So Britt, Britt, what about you? Yeah. I, I really believe that there are so many faces to homelessness. And if there's anything that I've learned at the giving keys, it's that, that there's so many reasons why someone could experience homelessness that have nothing to do with drugs or a criminal background, but could be falling on a hard time financially. Imagine if you were a minimum wage worker or an entry level worker who got disconnected from your family, you moved to a different city, you experience a significant medical problem and the medical bills are just so overwhelming that you can't afford your rent. And then you get out on the street and the trauma that that brings into your life um it's just you just never know, and I think that that's mm. that's the thing I would say is um, that I love about Caitlin's approach and and really what inspired her to even be able to carry out an idea like this is that restoration of humanity, looking at people um, with hopeful eyes and seeing their potential, and not making the first negative assumption. And so I think in terms of ways to live that out is if you see somebody in your neighborhood that's experiencing homelessness, that person's your neighbor. Just because they don't have a roof over their head doesn't mean they're not your neighbor. They live in your community. And so being able to go up and just say, hi, I'm Britt. What's your name? And just starting a conversation there and saying, um, 
it's, it doesn't even have to be a question about like, how did you get here? And are you looking right. for help? It can just be, hi, I'm Brit. How's your day going? Mm. Um, and I, th- and I, I think that. that that's really powerful. And, and that, that's that's a step in the right direction. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to have all the answers for everybody in your community, but just treating them like- a, I talk about that in this chapter, yeah. commit to collaboration, because it's about listening and it's about making generous assumptions. Because I feel like so many of us walk around with assumptions about others that we have no right to make. Mm. But if we can just come and be a listener and like, hey, how's your day going? Um, and find those points of connection. I think that's what humanizes yep. people mm-hmm. instead of projectizing them. Yeah, I think it's so important, specifically with homelessness, because they just don't get treated like human beings too many, all too often. Oh my god! And think about this, guys. Like, think about you know, if you're having a hard time in life, um, or that week or that day and you're going through something, whether it's with your family or a relationship you're in or your job or, you know, whatever. I mean, I know for me personally, sometimes I get in ruts and I feel depressed and I feel, you know, anxiety and stress and this and that. And, 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 and sometimes just talking to a friend helps so much. Like even, um, my therapist recommended that I call, uh, I call a friend like on my way to work in the morning so I can vent things mm-hmm. uh, and, or call them on the way back. And just so I have, I, I just, so I have a place to vent that I feel comfortable and, and heard and um, not judged. And it's been helping me so much the more I do that. Um, and I actually haven't been doing it the last couple weeks. Um, and I feel a difference. Like I feel more stressed and I feel more depressed and all the things. So my point in saying that is, you know, knowing that having a conversation can help me so much with whatever I'm going through. I feel like somebody that is living on the streets, they might not have that. Mm -hmm. And with whatever it is that they're going through, which is probably really intense, um, to have, to be able to provide that for them, just a listening ear and a connection. And so they can just talk and vent and like, you know, I think, that would be the goal that they would feel like their burden is, is, is lifted a little bit and they can just go on throughout their day with what they're experiencing just with a little bit of a, you know, maybe a lighter load. And we all have that, like, you know, it doesn't require, you know, money or a skill, or I know for me, I'm like, Oh, I don't have any cash on me today. You know I mean? Gosh, rarely do any of us have cash on us anymore, but we all have the ability to listen yeah. and to say, Hey, do you need to vent about something today? Because I, I sure do. Like, yeah, do you want to vent to me? And that's really empowering to realize we don't have to have some special skill yeah. or some like, you know, passion for homelessness or whatever. You just like set your heart on that default of, you know, I, I want to love another human today. I have yeah. something to give, and there it takes the pressure off because I think we can get, either get paralyzed or we feel pressure, and then mm-hmm. that leads to inaction. Yeah. which is the opposite of what we're all called to do. Mm-hmm. Right? Stop and connect. Okay, so this is the Going Scared podcast and what y'all are doing is no small thing and 10 years. I mean, 10 years is no joke. I mean, there's so many people that start things and stop them or it gets too hard or whatever. So I would love to hear um, in each of your lives how you're going scared right now. Maybe Britt can go first while Caitlin thinks about it. Oh, I finally got my answer. I got it. No, you you have an answer, I got it. I think you go first because I'm still thinking. Okay, okay, okay. I think what my answer would be something. I hope this answers the question. But um, right now, one of my the thing, one of the things that I'm I'm struggling with is being a new mother and the massive amount of mom guilt I'm feeling with working so much and. When I'm not at the office, which is pretty much every day, what by the time I get home with traffic and which I might leave, like I just don't get to spend good time with him. Like in the morning, it's like my time with him is I'm getting ready and he's pulling on me. So I feel like every time I'm with him, he's pulling on me to give him attention. And half the time I'm on my phone having to do work emails and I feel horrible about it. But then I simultaneously feel bad at the office and I feel like people are judging me even though no one said anything about this, but I just kind of feel like, oh, they're 
because no one else like here has kids. So they probably don't understand. And, and, but it's like, I feel like my, my friends that are mom friends think that I don't spend any time with my little boy. And so I feel judgment there, but then people that I work with that don't have kids, I feel judgment there. So anyway, so what I'm trying to kind of go go through is it was something that um what's what's your name said glennon doyle something right what's her name again glennon melton yeah yeah. um that's something about uh and i just reposted on my instagram she said the most revolutionary thing a woman can do is not explain herself Mm -hmm. even saying that makes me want to cry because (laughs) because i feel like i have to be like no but to my you know my friends that spend more time with their kids like but don't you understand that I have to work this hard because I have to provide for my family and feed my son and then you know and and then but then I feel like I have to justify myself to people that I work with like no you don't don't you understand I have to leave because I literally only have one hour to be with him and I need to bond with him otherwise he's gonna blah 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 and you know like and so I feel like I have to justify myself and 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 explain myself and so I'm really working on just being like, you know what? People are not going to understand and you are going to be maybe judged and I have to be okay with that. And I'm just going to try to power through and, and try to work on not explaining myself and just do what I know, what I feel is right and what I need to do to take care of both things as best as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. Well, it's deciding to quit living into the perception of other people. And it's almost like you're making assumptions that you're being judged. And oh my God, I've been there. I mean, I have a whole, that's a huge first part of my book is about. Girl, we need to get together or I'll read your book or both. both. It's hard. It's hard. But I think for me, it was like being able to embrace the paradox that I can be a really good mom and I can be a really good CEO. And when my daughter was five, she was finally able to verbalize like all the stuff you're feeling right now. She Mm -hmm. was like, mommy, if it wasn't for you, like Jolly and Daniel wouldn't have a job and Jack wouldn't have a home. And she started naming these things that she had grown up now seeing. And she goes, and also our family wouldn't be the same if you wouldn't have started Noonday. And that's when I realized that Noonday was not at the expense of being a mom, but it was for her flourishing. Like Mm -hmm. Noonday was for my family's flourishing too. And I think, I think you just have to own that and agreed. Cause I think when you explain yourself, you're sort of living into that. It's like, mm-hmm. you're explaining yourself to yourself really, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think when you can just be fully present at work and fully present at home, because all that energy, you know, that you're doing, trying to kind of control how others are going to perceive you is then robbing you from your, the present moment, which is all you have. Yeah. So I, I love that. I think that stopping to explain ourselves is what it, it's, it le- it's least an action that can help us to be, can help us to be more present. Yeah. And that is going scared because it takes a lot of courage, I think, just to own the story that you've been given. And the story you've been given is that you're the freaking boss lady, CEO of the Giving Keys and your freaking awesome mom to your son. And that's your story. And you've been given everything you need to be good at both of those. Yeah. And that's the truth, but it is hard to live into that. Thanks for sharing that. Britt, what about you? Yeah, I would say, uh, like it's definitely an internal journey of going scared. I think because I've been so in work mode, like committed to my job, um, that there's been, well, I guess like some backstory would be that I moved out to LA right when my parents got divorced. And I think I just kind of like hit the ground running and kind of had to, in a certain sense to like build a life and survive and provide for myself and be able to like get on my feet in a new town, but just running so fast for so long, I think it was a way of sort of avoiding dealing with some of the pain and just like experiences that I was in before I moved out here. And all of those family dynamics totally affect marriage and totally affect all your other relationships. And so um, I, as I've like been in counseling and um, just intentionally trying to slow down and like look inward, I think it's the process of facing some of those like painful memories and really 
allowing myself to like process them at the depth at which they need to be processed because I've been happy to be like, oh no, I'm totally, I, I'm good. Mm-hmm. I understand what happened. I could explain it and be very cerebral about it, but it's like getting down into my emotions and my body and um, really like processing some of that because I know there's things that have gone on that have not been dealt with that hold me back. Um, and so I think it's the process of just mm. going back into some of those experiences and um, having conversations with family and friends and my husband about those things and what it's made me believe about myself and believe about the world and believe about, um, yeah, just the way things work. So, and I think that specifically ties into like marriage and community. So um, I really want to like address some mm. of those fears and like my tendency to be super independent and be more vulnerable and like be in a place that allows me to have the the richness of relationship that I I've had in the past and I and I so value but have been not seeking or valuing or prioritizing as much. So I think that's one thing. And then also I started a master's program right. and just the process of doing work nice. and the master's program and um, investing in skill sets that aren't as natural for me, but are really important to me and the kind of work I want to continue to do. Um, that's just, I mean, I like took my first midterm in however many years, like over a decade, a few weekends ago. And I was like, so anxious about it. Yeah. Um, but I passed. So it's good. But I think it's just a new, it's, I did it. Did it. I did it. Uh, I got an 88% midterms Midterm. what oh the my heck God, it gives me ptsd yeah. but just wanting to go you. balance all that go and you. invest in in the stuff i care about but knowing that um it's gonna like stretch my capacity and my understanding so mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. well i think stopping and feelings are feelings is one of the bravest things that we can do and i talk about that in chapter six on the podcast with kurt thompson who's a psychiatrist and I think ultimately we're so afraid of really being alone Mm. in our grief and being alone in our feelings. And I think that when we realize we're not alone, which I, I love that that's, that's the life that Caitlin's lived by bringing others along around her. And that's the life that you're choosing to live, Brett. I think as we realize like we're not alone, like we don't, don't choose isolation don't choose aloneness. Call the person on the way home from work and vent. Make the time. Don't overwork just to hide your feelings, you know? So it's like stop and take do the work to process those feelings. And then to do that in the context of community, I mean, that's where it's at. Because you know what? If we don't do that, we're not going to last. And then then the home, what's going to happen to the homeless people? Because right. we're going to be burnt out. Right. You know, we're not going to last. So it really ends up fostering your purpose to stop and do the hard work of internal recognizing the narratives and then the external of doing that with others. It really ends up contributing to our purpose, I love that. which for you guys is, is ending homelessness. Yes, Hello. We can't do it on our own, but we can do yes. it all together. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning in to today's conversation. As a reminder, I am on the road right now celebrating the launch of my book, Imperfect Courage, and I would absolutely love to meet you. It's been so much fun to meet Going Scared podcast listeners. Head on over to jessicahonaker.com to see the remaining dates and cities. I cannot wait to see you there. And as a reminder, don't forget to head on over to Amazon, Target, wherever books are sold by and perfect courage or audible. Hello. I downloaded audible for the very first time. You get the first month for free and you get credits to buy books. So I already bought a couple books for free. So head on over there too. If you want my book for free, I mean, that didn't sound bad. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Our wonderful music for today's show is by my good friend, Ellie Holcomb. Going Scared is produced by Eddie Kolfholtz and I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared.